Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to see a lot of familiar and new faces actually in the audience today. So welcome to the 34th Annual Peer Mediation Conference, uh, Ventures in Peer Mediation. Uh, the Peer Mediation Conference is bringing together youth peer mediators for over 30 years now. This is the first year the conference has gone virtual to connect peer mediators around Hawaii and actually beyond as well as others aspiring to develop their own peer mediation program. Uh, my name is Jose Barzola from the Matsunaga Institute for Peace at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I, this year's, um, thank you for joining us to learn about, um, sorry, this year's peer mediation conference is brought to you as a collaborative of 22 different organizations around Hawaii. Uh, we are so gracious and thankful for their support for this conference to spread has been spread out during the month of April. The Peer Mediation Conference consists, has been consisting of an opening panel, 16 skill workshops, and a closing panel. And you can definitely learn more about the events at the Matsunaga Institute Eventbrite.com website. Uh, today's event will focus on the skills workshop on mediation through a cultural lens with a new and new uh, Mose Kanahele. Uh, thank you for joining us to learn about peer mediation skills. This session will deal with the following. Uh, Ho'oponopono is commonly thought of as a way to mend only family relationships, but family in the Polynesian perspective is extended to our communities and generations to follow. The way Polynesians address and deal with conflict will be the focus of today's presentation. Anuanui Mos Kanahele is a graduate student here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She's currently pursuing her graduate certificate in conflict resolution right here at the Matsunaga Institute for Peace and will be seeking a doctorate in the near future. Uh, her passion remains in helping Polynesian youth to have a better experience in schools through effective mediation and policy change. And to get us started, I'm gonna turn it over to our friend Anua Nui. Thank you so much for being with us today. Aloha, thank you for having me. So, do I just do the uh, share yeah, screen? Yeah, you, then... you can start the shared screen. Okay. And if anyone's wondering, Anua Nui is currently in the public space, so she's wearing her mask as responsibly <laughs> as it's <laughs> requested by CDC guidelines, so, <laughs> so thank you. Okay, awesome. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for um, allowing me to present for you today. Um, please let me know if you have any trouble hearing me because of my mask, but I will do the best that I can. Um, like what they said, my name is Anu Inouye Mose Kanahele, and I am a graduate student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I did receive my uh, master's in education administration last semester, and I'm currently pursuing my, uh, grad my graduate certificate in conflict resolution. I live on the beautiful island of Kauai, and I have 12 rambunctious children ranging from nine to 29. So I have had my share within the walls of my home with constant mediation. And so that's really how I got involved in um, trying to understand conflict resolution because uh, I really was just trying to figure out how to have a peaceful home with all of the children that I have. Um, I have a passion for um, not only uh, children, <laughs> but uh, for my cultural practices and to have them Im implemented in the Hawaii public schools for the benefit of not only Hawaiian students um, or Polynesian cousins, but for all ethnic backgrounds that choose to educate themselves in Hawaii Maine. So my topic for today is mediation through a cultural lens. And it's my hope that um, you understand that I'm just introducing you to different methods within the Polynesian community that I understand personally um, and through close friends. And it's not necessarily uh, solely for peer uh, mediation as far as the things that I'm talking about, but a broader understanding of how uh, mediation is done in Polynesia. So this uh, comic strip always makes me laugh because I can relate to it culturally. Many times you hear uh, people saying what you like, you call your mata or, you know, auntie comes rolling by when two kids are having an issue on the street and she mediates, assess, and then she go home and tell your parents. So by the time you get there, everyone is well aware of what you've done. So no matter how old you are in the Hawaiian and Polynesian um, cultures, you listen to your parents. So I just thought that this, uh, this comic strip was so funny because he's saying that traditional mediation in this aspect isn't working. And standard mediation doesn't always fit within the lens of my culture because the pendulum swings short. So in Polynesia, we have a wide casting net 
um, that embodies everyone as a collective to the problem and the solution. So today I wanted to share how mediation is done in Polynesia. And I'm choosing to speak uh, briefly on the islands of Hawaii, Samoa, Tonga, and Aotearoa. So each of these islands have core similarities, but there are a few differences that I wanna discuss. And throughout, I'll try to weave um, where I can see the similarities and the differences. Okay. So my lens, I wanna tell you a little bit about myself and where um, you know, I come from in my background. So I grew up with two completely different worlds. My dad was an engineer for Xerox. He was a Navy SEAL and a resident of Silicon Valley. My mother was a street smart athlete, cook and a pig slaughterer and a custodian from Kikaha, Kauai. At a young age, I began to wonder about the differences in conflict resolution and mediation because my dad would sit me at the dinner table. We would speak um, liberally and deliberately about allowing me, you know, my perspective, my perceptions and what I wanted out of, of the negotiation, whether it was I wanted to go here or buy something. And we would negotiate and debate and come to a resolution between the two of us. My mom, however, would frown on this behavior and always say that it wasn't about him, it wasn't about me and it wasn't about her, but it was about everybody in the family. And I kind of didn't understand that until I took a, a deeper look into Ho'oponopono as I was growing. My ex-husband, who I had eight children with, is from the island of Samoa. His first language is Samoan, and he didn't move to Kalihi until he was 12 when his grandmother passed. Now, what I observed in the 20 years of being married with him was family problems were not freely communicated. He nor anyone else would dare question what any older relative did or said. His auntie Fipe was and still is the matriarch of the home. And she has the power and the burden of a final say. She mediates um, and she decides what the resolution is for the Aina. Her decision was final, but it was deeply respected no matter what it was. My husband, Nalani Kanahele, is from the island of Mi'ihau. He's a mana leo. And he grew up, which was pretty amazing to me, similar to my, my ex-husband. He also didn't question the position or decisions of kupuna. The elders always knew best for their situation. The focus was on everyone on the island, not one individual or a group. When the conflict was over, it was not brought up again, and it was quickly forgiven, forgotten, not thought about, not spoken about. And the focus was always to move forward. Now this beautiful baby is my first grandson. And I put him up there because I'm so proud to have one. And he's going to be the result um, of all of these um, cultures coming together and how we do mediation. So I am really looking forward to seeing how that uh, comes out in him as he grows up. I wanted to start by introducing Auntie Mary Pukui. Um, she is known for her love of all things Hawaiian. She has contributed with her perseverance and preservation of the Hawaiian culture, taught to her by her grandmother who raised her on Hawaii Island. She also shed a light on similarities of Polynesian practices. So this is Auntie. Because I know my mother's language, I've enjoyed exchanging thoughts with other Polynesians to discover our, our likenesses and our differences. And because I know my fathers, I can explain to others what we have had here and lost and what we still retain. Knowledge to me is life. So Auntie Mary helped practitioners in keeping the fundamental art of Ho'oponopono alive. I say fundamental knowledge because every family did things a little different. Without her lifelong efforts, much of Hawaii knowledge would have been lost. I'm very grateful for her. She believed that the core of peacemaking was a sense of spirituality, respect for our ancestors, a focus on balance and harmony, and honoring our land. Native 
native ways of healing conflicts are seen as relationship centered and not agreement centered. Peacemaking maintenance of a strong community um, was sacred and it was just. Um, the process led to revered community strength. It restored harmony between groups and not just individuals. It is not concerned with distributing justice, but finding the most right in the situation. Rather, um, oh, maintaining harmony between individuals and exhibiting spiritual efficacy was the strive that all Hawaiians uh, strive for. Ho'oponopono was a way to maintain aloha. Sometimes this video plays a bit. Oops. Oops. Because I know. There we go. So Hawaiian philosophy, uh, philosophies and problem resolution are useful and important in the role of strengthening our families and our communities in our way. Variances are not important. The foundation of the practice is because it resulted in the repair of aloha. We honor our ancestors, our families, our communities, ourselves and our future generations. I believe there is a need to include native cultural practices in school and renew them in our homes. Many search for ho'oponopono practices, yet in our own backyard, it is not used to empower our youth and our community. Some Hawaiian families still practice forms of ho'oponopono because they were passed down from generation to generation. Many probably don't even know that there are remnants of their own family conflict resolution and, has, and it has trickled down um, through the generation. Next, we have Auntie. Well, Ho'oponopono means to pause, to make right, to, to put things back in balance again. Pono means to be in balance. Your life, your life needs to be in balance. So Pono means to be in balance. Everything is in balance, yeah? It's, it's correct, it's proper, it's right. Nothing's off, yeah? And I have been asked several times to conduct sessions for Ho'oponopono to make things right in a group, to make things right in a family, in an ohana. And as an important part of that, yes, you acknowledge the wrong that was committed. Acknowledge it first, number one, that it existed. Number two, then to find it in your heart to forgive someone. It is much bigger to forgive than to carry the burden of blame and then to move on from that point. Because only by forgiving and moving on can you reach higher point. So that's Auntie um, Sabra Kauka, and she is a Hawaiian historian here on Kauai. We, we absolutely love her. She's an educator, activist, and she's a, practice, uh, a practitioner of Ho'oponopono today. So she's often called to families here to kind of renew that practice within our homes. Well. Ho'oponopono is a Hawaiian dispute resolution method. It is grounded in the family. So family for us isn't just our immediate family, but it's the hui, it's everyone, right? It encompasses everyone. It is a process we use to restore balance and harmony. Kumu Sebra said that it's in the balancing. So the definition of ho'oponopono is ho, which is an action word. It's to make something to make right. And pono, which means right, righteous, or correct. So ho'oponopono is to make correct, to make whole, to make righteous, or to repair. An important note is it is not because something or someone was wrong. I think that in the Western way of looking at it, somebody is wrong and somebody is right. But it's a way to make the situation better for everyone, and it's a learning process. Hawaiian culture required aloha in all relationships and interactions. So how is it practiced? What's similar in standard mediation is that somebody presides over it. But I think that that's where the similarities end when it comes to the way that our culture approaches the situation. 
neutrality is not a part of the process because we are a part of everyone and we're not an individual seeking um, retribution of, ever, of anything. In Hawaii, individuals carry inside them all the significant people in their lives. So our vision of who we are does not start with us or end with us. It's a continuum. So it's our ancestors, it's ourselves in this present and our family, and also the generations to follow. So we see ourselves as a continuum on that line. How Hawaiian families practice Ho'oponopono varied because it was different for different families, communities, and the diversity of, of various islands. So a mediator or facilitator is basically chosen and the primary, uh, primarily families choose an elderly person or a person that's righteous or just and appropriate for that situation. Three ways that Ho'oponopono is conducted is face-to-face, -face, it's conducted in an individual's mind and then conveyed to that person when you see them or it's solely in the mind. And what I mean by that is sometimes you come into a situation where you cannot make amends with that person. There's, there's a reason, or you don't even know who this person is, but you feel wrong. And so Hawaiians believe strongly that your mind is able to heal that. And so you can conduct a whole ponopono within your mind and do that to resolve the situation. And then once, um, once done, everything and everyone involved moves forward, restored. The, trans the transgression is done and complete. Hawaiians wipe the situation from their minds and did not allow it to hinder, hinder the progression of anyone that was involved. Now, what I thought was interesting about this is I have seen this firsthand with my husband. Um, it's common practice for him. I've been to a few of his Ho'oponopono and he was, um, went through the whole thing and I brought it up, I think, you know, a while later and he looked at me and he said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, I, I, I just don't know, you know, that's over and I don't have any, anything to say about it. And he refused and stopped me from discussing it. And that was really a profound way of me understanding that it really is done and you just forget about it and you move on. Now, negative feelings um, that are harbored and not resolved, Hawaiians believe it can hurt the youngest person in the family, so the baby of the family. And I was the baby of the family, and I was um, quite often I would was struck ill when there was a conflict in our home. Um, we believe it's because they're the most vulnerable, and we also believe because the strength in that situation can cause a family to change. So my mom believed that when adults were being spiteful and painful towards one another, when they experienced a, a child who was in pain or sick, it changed their focus. And they were able to turn their anger into compassion and realize that things were bigger than the problems that they were, that they were trying to hold on to. So I always thought that was interesting because I do remember being sick quite often when I was a child. And when all of this is said and done, life is changing, people make mistakes, they make additional decisions, and therefore harmony is fleeting. So when all is said and done, and you need to, you just, you know, hold my call, call and you just do them again. So then Ho'oponopono starts again. So what is happening in Ho'oponopono? It is correcting the balance that has been destructed. It's problem solving. It's listening with love and with respect. It's spiritual and physical cooperation. So not just cooperating physically by doing something, but spiritually cooperating with the process. It's working together for the well-being of another. It's maintaining harmony. And it's a need for peace and healing that continues. So, how my ohana does ho'oponopono. When I was growing up, my mother was in charge of it. When she was growing up, it was her, her mother, so my grandmother, and now it's me. So in my particular home and in my line, 
So women are more dominant and we are the ones that hold the responsibility of Ho'oponopono. But uh, like in my uncle, my mother's brother, um, in his family, it's the men. And so my uncle does the Ho'oponopono and my nephews. So again, that's the variance, right? So we let the person who was harmed feel how they feel. We believe that it helps them purge from the inside and then it allows that space to be filled with aloha. We let them cry, curse, run, you know, sit, leave, whatever they have to do. We give them the freedom and the safety to express their emotions however they want to express them. And we don't uh, take any of it personally. It's not easy, but we let them do it. Then we get together as a family. So right now, um, me and my children, we live on two different islands at various times. And so with technology, we will have everybody get together. So there isn't a whole ponopono that we do that everybody is not involved no matter where they are. But when we're physically together, we sit in a circle and our designated spot over the generations has always been the kitchen table. Uh, we pull it and we ask Heavenly Father and our ancestors for help in the situation, because um, we don't feel that we can do it alone. I ask the person who has offended to open it, and I ask the person who was wrong to close it. We discuss the situation with everyone involved. So number one child and number five child has a spat, but it isn't between number one and five, it's between all of us holistically. So we give the opportunity for everybody to have an input on how it affects them and how they feel about the situation and however they need to respond. Everyone participates. When you love your family and things happen, it's very hard to bounce back, but we work hard to remain each other's um, lifeline and respond with aloha. It helps our family continue to grow and we put more work into it. So we often hear that it's the destination, not necessarily the ending result. It's the destination that helps us recognize our behavior and our actions. And so the next time that this happens, we're able to respond quicker and we're hoping that there's less conflict, right? And it just removes us and puts us in a better situation. And then we move on. After we're done with our ho'oponopono, we do what is called hi'uvai. So hi'uvai is um, a way that we clear our heads and we get rid of all of those bad juju, right? So our head space is in contemplation and reflection. It's for ourselves and our family. Um, again, we're thinking about our ancestors, our current, our future uh, generations. And our process is after we ho'oponopono, we prepare fish, poi, and salt. The next day, we get up early in the morning and we head to go chase the sunrise, which in our island is Hanale. So we get there before the sun rises. And then we pule. We then enter the water and we dunk ourselves three times. We don't wash the salt, the salt water off of our body. When we're done with that, we come back to the, the sand and we eat our fish and our poi with the salt and we continue to reflect. At this point, it's a personal decision on when you feel that you're done. And when you feel that you're done, you go and you chase the sunset. So we will drive from Hanale to Kikaha, which is on the west side. And then we say a prayer. But when you're at Kikaha, if you still feel the need to hi'uvai, which is to go under the water, then you do that. Everything at this point is personal of what you need to cleanse yourself from the situation. And then once you close it, at this point, we're completely exhausted, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And then we go home and we usually zonk out. And the next morning, it's almost as if you have a different lens and a lot of things just seem and feel clearer. Everything is removed. So now I'm going to move on to Samoa. And when I go into Samoa and Tonga, um, Samoa is a personal um, thing that I was able to get information on just observa um, observation with the 20 years married to my ex-husband and just kind of interviewing him. And with Tonga, 
it was me interviewing a very close friend of mine and his father, and he was translating to me. So these are things that I've learned um, from the cat. Sorry about that. I forgot to click as I was talking. Okay, so we're moving on to Samoa. And that is, and the, the practice that I want to speak about is called Ifoma. So it's seeking forgiveness. It's um, helping with their disputes of really, really hard conflicts, um, deep issues. Um, it's trying to keep the peace among the village and the people that are in there, the families. And you accept the dispute and you agree to the result. So um, it's used to heal family that are going through not just the regular, you know, you stole something. It's, it's, a, it's a deep um, conflict that's happening. So Ifoa consists of justice, punishment, retribution, forgiveness, and respect. So this is Chief uh, Justice Patsu, and he states that mediation is something very new, but very old in Samoa. It has many similarities with the traditional Samoan way of settling disputes through the village council or the matai of the family. So Samoan families mediate disputes the same way as Hawaii for, you know, those little incidences. So instead of rehashing that method, I wanted to introduce you to Ifonga. Um, and this is basically for high levels of conflict. And usually in Ifonga, it involves extremely painful situation and deeply wounding conflicts. There is also a gray line when it comes to cultural differences and practices dealing with resolutions of these things. Fa'a Samoa or the Samoan way is heavily weighted and respected in mediation. So, there's two types of laws. One is a common law and the other is customary law or, um, well, common law is more like the in English law that we're used to. Um, the law often falls back, however, to any decision that is made during an ifonga. Customary law is where the village fono or the assembly of ali'i and matai determine the dispute outcome or the terms. This body has the power to impose penalties on the village misconduct, usually in the form of money, fine mats, animals, food, and other um, offerings of tasks that the offender must complete. It can also evolve into absolute banishment from the village. So I look at it like common law, I think absolute banishment would be if they were like, you know, sent to jail, and in customary law, it would be a banishment from the village, right? Rarely to never does anyone in common law or other go against the decision of the fono and during the ifono process. Punishment is taken seriously to the person and social pressures ensure that the offender abides by the decision that will mend the conflict. So in this lens, ifonga is the, is the medium of conflict resolution. Uh, so in, in, in the Fonga, uh, the Ali'i uh, rises early in the morning uh, before uh, uh, daybreak or around dawn, and he goes with uh, some family members or whoever is uh, uh, directly uh, related to the offender, not necessarily the offender goes and, and uh, completes the act, but the Ali'i. Okay, so in this video, he tells us that it is um, that it isn't necessarily the person who is offended that approaches the family, but traditionally performed by a lee or a high chief of the offending village or person deemed appropriate to represent on the behalf of the situation. The ali'i is the mediator and he arises in the morning um, and he's there quietly with his rep representatives um, let me see if I can get some uh, so pictures. In, in, uh, so in, in, in the four. There we go. So these are examples of um, different situations where they uh, they show up. So in this picture right here, you can see that this would definitely be the lead because he's on a chair and everyone else is sitting down. This one, obviously, it's him. And everybody else will be in the background of him, but they're always going to be facing the fale, which is the house. So now we go on to speak so, a little bit more. You are covered in the fine mat, and you don't 
say anything. You don't even let the family know you're there. Ah, you you do it because you know so you're not trying to get their attention you're just trying to uh be there and so by the time they wake up they realize oh okay uh, so it's asking for uh forgiveness and it's also a uh, a way of uh going to the offended uh as an offender and uh humbling yourself uh, so why is it considered a act of public humiliation? Leang, uh, if it is up to the family, Leo El Watua, how they decide to accept your 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 reform. Uh, because one of many things can happen. Either they can come and take you in once they realize that you're there, meaning they've accepted your forgiveness, don't worry about it. Uh, or they can have you sit out there for however long they want. Okay, so what we have here on these pictures is the offender is under these mats, okay? And these are the his his village or his family. And, and what they do is they basically sit out there until um, there is a resolve. So now in this picture, what you're seeing is when it's done. And so what happens is this is the family here that decided that they are going to forgive the offender. And so they come in and they invite into their home the offenders, um, the Matai or the Ali'i um, or any religious uh, person into their home. They grieve together verbally. They um, embrace each other and they agree to move forward. So the offending of Ali'i or Matai is sent home with gifts, uh, fine mats, food, money sometimes. And what that shows is um, an agreement between the families that there is going to be no more further um, a retaliation, that everything is done, everything is sealed um, for the sake of the families in the community. So that's uh, basically how an Ifola works. I've had the opportunity to watch a few of them and it's a very emotional situation, but that's a higher um, uh, form of mediation in Samoa. So now we are going to move over to uh, Sola and Sola, um, the gentleman that helped me, the father refers to their form of mediation as kole fakemolemole, which is to ask for forgiveness. And uh, let's move on. So Tonga is the only country to remain under Tongan rule and their conflict resolution um, for eternal conflicts uh, really do mirror that of Hawaii and Samoa. Um, but I thought what was interesting is their core concepts are um, modesty, respect, collectivism, the Tongan way, which is similar to Fa Samoa, humility, and of course, hospitality. And you have... Um, there's like four um, classes. So you have the king, you have the high chief, you have the priest, which is religion coming into Tonga, and you have the commoners. I wanted to talk about Auntie here. So when I was talking to this gentleman, he was explaining to me that in Tonga, and especially in their family, their um, females are the ones that are um, the ones who uh, mediate. And so similar to my ex-husband's family with Auntie Sipe, she was the matriarch. And most of the way that Tongan does their mediation, it's always going to be from um, an, the eldest auntie or the highest uh, ranking female member. Now, again, this is just something that was based on my friend's and his father's experiences. Um, there, is little diff there are little differences in Tongan mediation or the process to make a situation whole. In mediation, a vindictive occurrence, resentment must be addressed. Fundamentally, Tonga, like all Polynesian islands, are rooted in harmonious relationships within their society as a whole. Mediation is bounded in the idea that they conduct themselves with the utmost respect. So in their apologies, it's very rooted in firm values in community and social order. And the apology is accepted. They are found blame blameless and they try to move on. What I want to make clear is in these processes, it does not mean that the uh, behavior is excused. 
but it encourages a better future for the outcome from that person. Now I'd like to move on to Aotearoa. The existence of, or the essence of the Maori people is mana and tapu. Those are the keys to understanding their um, conflict resolution style. It's very, very similar to Hawaii. Uh, mana is um, Mana is to honor and to have a prestige um, birthright um, in your actions and the way that you deal with your community. Tapu is all things that are sacred and a spiritual measurement of your actions. For less offensive, korero, which sounds similar to olelo, is how they talk it out. What I thought was interesting when I was studying for um, the Maori people in Aotearoa is the one person would begin the dialogue. That person does not talk about the issues directly, but would begin to air out their thoughts and feelings um, without bringing up the actual conflict. Um, at the end of the consensus would be made without having directly said, blah, 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 did this or that. They talk about the emotions and the feelings that happen because of the conflict, but not the conflict directly itself. The younger generations, the young, younger Maori do not prefer this. They like the directness of Western cultures, but the elders often frowned on such tactics in resolving their matters. Um, let me see. And so in um, Aotearoa, mana, which is a strong connection to each other, tapu, which is what they hold sacred and utmost in the deepest respect, and korero, which is for them to talk it out, is the three um, uh, uh, basic um, practices or things that are important when they're doing their conflict resolution. So in conclusion um, of my presentation, I wanted to recap on the similarities and differences. So Hawaii, a mediator is an elderly person who is respected, they determine the best approach. They move forward. The youngest member is, um, is possible for uh, getting affected by a situation, so they want to resolve it. And again, life is fleeting, so just repeat the cycle. In Samoa, the mediator is a chief, a li'i, or a matai, and they petition on behalf of the village and the offender um, and the family. They do it in a traditional custom, and they move forward without speaking of it. In Tola, it is the eldest female or respected person. They petition on behalf of the village and family. It is face-to-face -face in their, their custom traditions, and they also move forward without speaking on it. Aotearoa, the mediator, is an elderly or respected person. They determine the best approach, um, but it's not a uh, forward, and it is face-to-face. -face. Um, and they hold no negativity towards uh, that person as they move on. So as we learned today, Hawaii and Aotearoa seem like the most similar and Tonga and Samoa seem the most similar, but you can see that there's a lot of things that interconnect with all four islands. Uh, mediation is very important in every culture and I appreciate your time in allowing me to share with you today. I am hoping as a part of the process Peer mediators in Hawaii help students, advisors, and administration on their campuses learn through cultural lenses. So when attending to a conflict on campus, campus, having an understanding of cultural differences will bring resolve that makes sense to the people that they're trying to help. I mahalo for you for uh, bearing with me today. This is my first virtual, so I appreciate your patience. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Mahalo. Thank you so much, uh, Anue Anue. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please uh, post them in the chat. And that was just a wonderful, insightful. I, I've learned so much today, and I look forward to bringing that knowledge uh, with me as I interact with different communities because I think yeah it's it's definitely so important um, but I am looking through the 
seems like everyone's just kind of taking it in right now. So I guess you covered it all the bases. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start my little spiel that I do. And then if any questions do come up, I will, uh, we, we can take a break. But I do just want to thank you and you for just providing us that wonderful knowledge and uh, those extra tidbits that are going to help uh, on our, you know, it's, it's our toolkit really when, as mediators going out and as conflict resolvers. So I truly appreciate your insights uh, into mediation. And I know you yourself are uh, training to be a mediator yourself. You've gone through classes, you're going through training. So it's very encouraging and you're right. It starts at the home. It, it's, it's so fascinating. As you go into this field of conflict resolution, you're like, you start learning the different uh, terminology and you're like, I've been doing this in my household for so many years. Now yeah. I, it's all kind of coming together. So uh, I'm, I'm glad. It, it sounds as though your household has given you lots of opportunities to practice <laughs> unofficially. So a a yeah. uh, your approach as a peace builder and conflict resolver, thank you. But most of all, uh, I appreciate your passion and kindness and all that you do. Um, well, you. And last but not least, I do want to thank everyone for joining today's uh, event. Uh, we deeply appreciate your interest and support in joining us to learn about peer mediation programs throughout Hawaii at the 34th Annual Peer Mediation Conference of Ventures in Peer Mediation.